Welcome back to The Mining Pod. On today's show, we're joined by Claire Medley of Kaiko Research to discuss Bitcoin's market. We talk about Bitcoin's market post-FTX, what a healthy Bitcoin marketplace looks like, and how miners influence prices. Introducing the newest and most requested course from Foundry Academy, Intro to Hashboard Diagnosis and Repair, offered by the same experts who provided top technical training for mining technicians in the US. This Essential Academy course will take place in Rochester, New York from May 1st to the 5th, 2023. With a strong focus on mastering micro-soldering basics, Foundry's dedicated instructors possess years of ASIC hardware experience and will guide you through each step of the process. They'll ensure that you gain the confidence and skills required to undertake basic repair jobs and keep your operation healthy and hashing. Register today at foundryacademy.com. Welcome back to the Mining Pod. Really excited for today's show. We're talking about Bitcoin markets. We don't do that too often on the show. We talk a lot about ASICs and hash price and operations, but it's always good to take a broader macro view of what's happening with our favorite coin, Bitcoin, and get the inside scoop on it. As such, we brought on Kaiko Research, one of the preeminent, uh, preeminent uh, research groups in the space that really focuses on market depth, talking about market liquidity, looks at all the exchanges out there. Uh, Claire Bendali, thank you so much for joining us today. Really excited for this conversation. Thanks. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah. As I said, like before we, we started recording here, Whoever's listened to this podcast or uh, the other podcast I do with CoinDesk, like I, I show you guys a lot because I, I read you guys a lot. And uh, anyone who's definitely listening right now, don't just stop here and listen to this podcast. Also, go check out uh, their interviews or go check out their newsletter, which I believe comes out at least once a week. Uh, it's great insight. You're not going to find other places on uh, Bitcoin marketplaces. For today's conversation, we're going to dive in uh, into like what the market structure of Bitcoin looks like right now because... Bitcoin price is going up. It's like 80% year to date or something like that. At the same time, the market structure just looks weird for it. Uh, there's not a lot of liquidity out there. And as we get into the depth is weird on these exchanges, uh, which some people are positing as could be a problem uh, for Bitcoin a little bit here. But I'll hand it over to you just to set the table for the conversation. Tell me a little bit what we, you guys are seeing from the market structure, maybe posting it back to FTX. Yeah, so Kaiko Research, so Kaiko is a data company. So we have access to essentially this gold mine of highly granular tick level liquidity data. And so by liquidity data, I mean many things. It can be trade volume, it can be market depth, it can be the bid ask spread, metrics for price slippage. But essentially, what we want to look at when we look at liquidity is price stability and essentially how easy it is to push up or down the price of an asset. So Kaiko Research, we use all of this data that we're just sitting on. Um, that's actually the product that we sell, and we analyze market trends. So one of the biggest metrics that we've been studying ever since the FTX collapse is market depth. What market depth essentially says is, what is the quantity of bids or asks on Bitcoin order books? So we have this Bitcoin market depth chart that has gone a little bit viral on Twitter, and I'm sure many of the listeners have probably seen it floating around, but it essentially shows a sharp downwards trend ever since the FTX collapse. This means that the quantity of bids and asks, which are typically supplied by professional market makers on Bitcoin order books across all exchanges, has plummeted um, ever since the FTX exchange went under. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about that um, and maybe even back up the truck for listeners who are not super familiar with exchanges and the way that uh, market makers interact with markets themselves. So on cryptocurrency exchanges, this of course is where you buy and sell assets. You need to have essentially a counterparty to every trade. So that's the function that a market maker fulfills. They'll place bids and asks on what's called an order book. Um, and so then if I'm a price taker, let's say I want to just buy or sell, my buy or sell, which is placed as a market order, will be at, will be matched with the bid or ask on the Bitcoin order book. So typically in crypto markets and in traditional financial markets, market making is done by professionals. You have these big firms that have billions of dollars of capital. They trade on many different exchanges and they're making markets for many different crypto assets. Bitcoin is just one of them. Bitcoin being the largest cryptocurrency, of course, is also the most liquid which means that there is the largest quantity of Bitcoin that is on these order books. So it's essentially the dollar value is the highest for Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency. Um, so that's a bit about how market makers will interact on an exchange. Um, the problem is that FTX also had a market maker. They had Alameda Research, which many people um, now know. They were closely intertwined. 
Um, but Alameda was at one point one of the largest market makers in crypto. There's quite a few others that remain. Um, but after Alameda went under, along with FTX, we noticed something that we dubbed the Alameda gap. This essentially was a huge drop in market depth across crypto markets, which we assume is due to the impact of the loss of Alameda, one of the largest market makers, among many other market makers that suffered a bunch of losses also with the collapse. Okay, so like the first thing that I thought of when I saw this drop, and we'll throw that image up on the screen when we're talking here for at least a YouTube version. If you're just listening to this, just imagine like a, a, a cliff, and that's basically what um, we're thinking of here. Like the market depth just dropped off a cliff. And so for market makers themselves, like where did they go exactly? And why did nobody try to really plug this hole? I would have thought that someone would jump in. I know Wintermute is another large market make out, market maker out there. And like my understanding is that they've sort of jumped in there, but why are we not seeing anyone step on where Alameda left off? So I think there were two major market events that have happened since the FTX collapse. One was the collapse of Genesis. Genesis was one of the largest lenders and they essentially were, think of the wheel, FTX was like on the outer rim of the wheel, whereas Genesis was sort of in the middle. They were lending to all of the different entities in the cryptocurrency industry, um, including many market makers. So they essentially provided very easy capital to professional traders that would provide liquidity to these exchanges. So their collapse essentially turned off a crucial liquidity tap for these market makers. So that was the first market event. Then the second market event is the banking crisis. And this is what we are seeing the uh, the impacts that are still being felt today. Um, we had Silvergate and Signature, which were two crucial crypto friendly banks based in the United States, each offered a USD payment network. So essentially these USD payment networks enabled hundreds of institutional traders and market makers and exchanges to seamlessly interact. Um, and there was 24 seven, you could always transact and settle from an exchange in US dollars, which is if you're a business, often at the end of the day, you need to settle your accounts in fiat. You can't just end the day with crypto. So that's why it was such an important, systemically important um, actor in the crypto space. So once they collapse, you now no longer have these liquidity channels, these USD payment rails connecting market makers with exchanges, which has made it a lot harder to actually deploy capital um, in a timely manner across different exchanges. Yeah, pretty rough situation. There's like one-two combo. Uh, what, tell me a little bit about the price action here because market makers, like you said, they, they create the bids and the asks and that helps forms like the market structure and that leads to like the price uh, for, for Bitcoin or at least like a, a reasonable price on most exchanges. How have you guys been following like the volatility of price since then? And, and tell me a little bit about the fluctuations you guys have been seeing. Yeah. So Bitcoin's price, I mean, as you said, it's at up almost 80 percent year to date. It's had this almost phenomenal rally amid essentially massive headwinds for the industry, like structural, systemically, I guess, negative headwinds are facing the industry right now. Yeah. Crypto markets continue to rally. Um and so they're very volatile right now. Bitcoin's volatile is actually at, I think, its highest level since the FTX collapse. And this was hit, I think, over the past few days. Um, and so Bitcoin is headed towards the upside. And I think while there's a powerful narrative swirling, especially in the aftermath of the banking crisis, essentially saying this is why this is Bitcoin's core purpose. Uh, you can't trust traditional finance. You can't trust, like, be your own bank. Um, yet that narrative is met with extremely low liquidity. And so liquidity, when it's low, is bad when prices fall to the downside, but it can also be positive towards the upside. So when you have this buying pressure spurred by this real powerful narrative, very bullish for Bitcoin, it's met with very little resistance um, on these order books. There's simply not much market making activity happening right now. So I think it's a combination that has pushed Bitcoin's price up over the past few months. So like I'm asking for a gut feeling here as opposed to some data, which you're, you're spewing in spades right now. And it's awesome. <laughs> Do you think like this narrative is strong enough to keep pushing us upwards uh, based on what you're saying right now? Or do you think like at a certain point, the fact that there's not a lot of market makers, there's not a lot of liquidity is going to lead to this mini bubble or this mini run popping? I mean, that's a, I wish I, I wish I could predict Bitcoin's price once if I could then I would have a very different type of job, but um, <laughs> like in terms of unless the liquidity situation, I guess someone steps in, like you said, winter mute, they've really ramped up their market making activities. It's more than that, though. It's there's also banking and USD payment rails. There needs to be some entity that steps in 
and says, I'm open for business. I'm here to accept new market makers, new exchanges as clients, which will probably happen not in the United States. It will happen in a place like Europe or in APAC. Um, but we're not yet seeing a dominant banking entity step forward that's willing to do this. Um, so I think it will take time to sort of repair this Alameda gap in liquidity. Um, and until that happens, Bitcoin's upwards momentum is fragile. I, I will say that, that it is definitely fragile and it does not mean that it will continue. Okay, so a little bit of a bearish take, but that's good. And I apologize for the uh, the uh, price talk there. <laughs> I also don't ask my, my participants to, to give that, but I feel like maybe here is where we're at. Tell me a little bit about like the historical depth of the Bitcoin market, though, because I think that's sort of lost for a lot of participants when uh, we come across experts such as yourselves or we come across data on markets. It's just confusing. It's like, okay, how do I place this within like the context of Bitcoin's all time marketplace? Are we at like a three year low in terms of liquidity? Are we actually at a pretty healthy level uh, given everything else happening? So we're at 10 month lows right now in terms of the native units, as in we, you can denominate market depth in dollars. That's when you take like whatever the quantity of Bitcoin multiplied by the price. Um, but Bitcoin is placed on order books as Bitcoin. So we typically take the native units. So it's at 10 month lows. It's also, I think, at a little less than 10 month lows when you actually convert that into dollars. But because there are price effects, because Bitcoin's price has increased, it doesn't necessarily mean the quantity of Bitcoin has increased on these order books. So we try to get away, uh, do away with these price effects. So it's at gotcha. 10 month lows now. Um, I guess the good news is that Bitcoin's liquidity increased massively in the run up to the FTX collapse, even though there was the Celsius collapse, the Terra collapse. And so there still was a ton of capital entering the industry. It was really, though, the FTX collapse that was the big trigger um, that caused just this sort of mass contagion across all market participants. Gotcha. Yeah, well, we'll see what happens with that one. It seems like it's not going to be fixed anytime soon. Um, let's turn over to some Binance stuff since we zoomed through that. You guys have been writing a lot about Binance and how it started dominating the the marketplace for exchanges back in the summer, uh, notably because like, I think I think you guys quoted 13 trading pairs uh, went to zero fees, which like everyone was, of course, going to go trade on Binance because like, hey, I don't have to like pay a trading fee. But then they got rid of that recently and we're starting to see some slippage in terms of their uh, people using that exchange. At the same time, though, Binance is like really in the headlines right now with a, like a lot of questions from the CFTC and others. So um, maybe give us like a little bit of rundown of what's happening with Binance, uh, its importance within like the Bitcoin ecosystem, and then how you're seeing its current order book. Yeah, for sure. So I think Binance in last July, that's when they first rolled out their zero fee trading program for Bitcoin. And they did it for, I think, a couple months for ETH2. Um, so that had an instant, extremely dramatic impact on all market structure. Their market share versus their closest competitors like Coinbase, Coinbase OKX, Squabby absolutely surged. I think it's up 20% since they did this. Um, and then as of two weeks ago, it was like the day before they actually stopped doing their zero fee trading. More than 60% of all trade volume on Binance was for these same 13 Bitcoin trading pairs that had zero fees. So that is quite shocking. It means that 60% of all trades were essentially Binance was earning zero revenues on this, which is quite a sacrifice to make, especially if you're the world's largest exchange. That's a massive amount of revenue you could be taking. But I think it shows that the second they turned this zero fee program off, the market share instantly plummeted. So it shows that these traders, it wasn't sticky. It likely wasn't even like a certain quantity of traders. It could have just been a handful that for I'm not really sure where all that volume came from because it vanished the second they turned off the zero fee program which makes sense like if you're a trader you're not going to trade bitcoin when you have to pay fees you're going to chase the lowest fees possible um so i think that's a bit what's happening now is that binance i don't think it's a coincidence i think the lawsuit combined with the zero fee it happened all in the same week i think they're really uh, tiptoeing around regulators now they don't want any further accusations of sort of unfair um unfair behavior in a highly competitive market. So you think it's kind of like a, a market manipulation standpoint, maybe they were trying to get away from by like adding a zero fee or what do you mean exactly by that point? I mean, it it's typically exchanges when you don't have, when you have zero fees, it sort of invites market manipulation. Binance, mm -hmm. they publicly declared that they're not 
like they're they've taken a lot of measures to prevent this practice on their exchange especially for zero fee pairs but yeah what are you to say if you're a trader like and you have zero fee trading i mean why not just trade back and forth like it's not Binance has to, you have to trust that Binance is making sure this isn't happening because on the data side, like we can't see this. We can't determine what is a back and forth trade versus what is a real trade by a trader actually just making a bet. Um, so it's very hard. It's a complicated topic. The whole wash trading market manipulation, especially on an exchange as large as Binance that has billions and billions of trades um, volume every single day. Gotcha. And as we turn away from that conversation, just like the push the audience, definitely go check out some of this more information on their newsletter because a lot is going to impact like when you're choosing to sell Bitcoin or hold Bitcoin for your operation. And for miners, that that Bitcoin actually matters. Like when you sell it actually has an impact on your business. So something to definitely uh, take into consideration. Let's turn towards mining itself though now. Uh, a little preamble here if I can. Marathon and Hut8 were basically like the last two large public miners that had not sold any Bitcoin coming out of the bear market. Maybe we're going to bull market now, maybe we're still in a bear market. I guess the listener can decide. But they had not sold any Bitcoin in 2022, but in January, they decided to start selling Bitcoin. They're basically just selling like their operational amounts. At this point, I'd say about almost all the 20 or so public companies are selling Bitcoin into the open market. There's still significant hodls on the books, uh, namely Marathon has like 10,000 Bitcoin books. Hut8 has a little under that, around 8,000. And think riots next with maybe around 6,000 Bitcoin. Tell me a little bit about how you think about these Bitcoin sells going into a bear market or a back and forth market. During the bull market, all these miners were hodling, which I would assume could only help out the market, but it's a very different place at this point. Yeah. I mean, miners are in a very tough position right now. Like They really do need to sell their Bitcoin to meet operating costs. And so if that's a monthly sell order that they're placing, I imagine they work with a professional trader in order to get the best price for their sales. Um, I know there's quite a few crypto prime brokers out there who will do this service for them. But it, nonetheless, even if it is spread across many different Bitcoin markets and exchanges, it's still a significant sell pressure. Um, and I believe that that's probably what we saw also last year that very much was a headwind to Bitcoin's price, especially after the FTX collapse and over the summer when energy prices were hitting hitting new highs. Um, and I, I think that if that continues, especially with reduced access to capital, um, that we can expect, like, I guess maybe more big sell orders once a month from Bitcoin miners, especially if all of the largest public trader uh, miners are doing this now, it is significant sell pressure combined with low liquidity. I'm going to give you a theoretical here and it might be really unfair, but I kind of want to ask it. What if Marathon one day just like dumped all 10,000 Bitcoin? Uh, they just had something going on, fire sale, they just dumped it. What would that sort of event look like uh, within like the current Bitcoin market? Would that be a blip? Would that be nothing? Is that hard to tell from the data? I mean, there stuff like that has happened before. I mean, news broke just last week that the government had actually offloaded thousands of Bitcoin that they held. And they did this without anyone noticing and without any adverse price effects. Bitcoin has been rallying for the past three months. Um, and so... I think there have been these large secret sales of Bitcoin that if they're spread out wide enough across enough markets in over the course of a day or a week, then you don't see a dramatic price impact. Um, however, because liquidity is thin, like never, you know, never say never, that could have an impact. It, it's hard to know. It depends on their trading strategy. Yeah. One thing, just like maybe some commentary, you might have some thoughts on it. It's interesting to think back about all these Bitcoin miners and they really used a, a marketing point that they were hodling their Bitcoin all through the bull market. And now they're met with like downward pressure on the price of Bitcoin and also a very thin market where they have to sell Bitcoin into it. And so I think a lot of times, or at least when I was thinking about it the last two years, I always just thought it from a price perspective, right? The fact that it would have been nicer to sell during a bull market because the price was higher. But also if you think about like the slippage or whatnot, like there's more liquidity in that marketplace. So you get more, uh, like a higher average price for Bitcoin during that period than now, because you might be causing more price pressure on it. Um, I'm not sure if I'm thinking about that correctly, but it is like an interesting are. point. It's harder, it's harder in thin markets to get a good price for your Bitcoin. Even if you see the price on the screen, you might not get that price once you complete executing your market sell order. Um, and so that's why you really, like you, if you're selling that much, they're without a doubt working with a professional trader to make sure they get the best average price for the Bitcoin they need to sell. Gotcha. Glad I'm thinking about that correctly. <laughs> okay. Last question for you as we sort of wrap up here. 
returning to like the beginning of the conversation, you did touch on this again. So uh, more of just like asking it again, because I'm, I'm interested. What does like a, a healthy market structure look like for Bitcoin over the next six to 12 months? What are some things from Kaiko that you guys are looking for? Maybe if it's from a data point perspective, maybe it's headlines, maybe it's information about like market makers moving back in space. But again, what does a healthy Bitcoin market look like from your purview? Um, I mean, almost certainly looking at this market depth metric and seeing a reversal in the downwards trend that we've seen since the FTX since the FTX collapse, but also volumes. Um, this is another thing. Volumes are sort of from the price taker perspective. In 2023, volumes have actually reverted to their pre-FTX levels. They've been pretty consistently high over the past three months, which is a good sign. I would say trade volumes is one of, in my opinion, one of the strongest indicators of interest in the overall space. Like when volumes are high, it means that you have a lot of engagement from retail, from institutional. And while volumes are far from their bull market 2021 levels, it's still a good sign to see that they're quite stably high. Um, unfortunately, over the past two weeks, ever since the banking crisis, we've actually seen a slight reversal in this trend. Um, but we'll be paying close attention to trade volumes over the next few months, but also the market share of volume to see if this dispersing across U.S. exchanges or back to Binance or onto maybe a new actor that will enter the space. Love it. Claire, thank you so much for joining the Mining Pod. Again, go check her out on Kaiko Research. Go check out the newsletter. Uh, what's your Twitter handle or anything else that people can go and follow you at? Yeah, it's at Clara underscore Medali. So simple as that. Perfect. We'll get you a, hopefully like at least five followers from this. Everyone nice. go follow her. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. Well, thank you again and speak soon. Bye.